Storytelling with data is a buzzword, and in this video we're going to break down what it means, why it's important, and how to do it. Storytelling with data means connecting the dots between different data points so that your audience understands what the data is telling them and what the next steps are. It means providing context so the audience understands what the data is telling them about what happened in the real world. Why in a world of science and technology would we want to use a story to contextualize our data instead of just using the raw data and the numbers that we get when the data is created? Well, the reason for that is that our brains are hardwired to remember stories and to listen and contextualize stories more so than they are with raw data. That's the reason people believe things that seem completely irrational when you look at the numbers, because often those things have a good story attached, particularly an emotionally charged story, it's easy not to believe the statistics when they have no context. It's very hard not to believe a story that you're told. Within human history, until very recently, stories were the primary way that we received information. People would travel from town to town, and in each town they'd be questioned on what had happened, what was going on in different towns, what was going on nationally, and stories are the ways that they would communicate that information. So our brains are hardwired to listen to stories, they're not hardwired to listen to statistics and data, or to contextualize statistics and data. Before we get too deep into storytelling, I want to talk a little bit about what storytelling is not, because there are a few traps that you can fall into if you don't do this right. First off, storytelling is not telling the story of how you did the analysis. Storytelling is not generating artificial suspense or just sharing your own moments of brilliant insight. Data storytelling is also not necessarily telling a story the traditional way. You're not going to have a beginning, a middle, an end, a protagonist, and a quest. Storytelling is such a critical skill for data scientists because unless we can contextualize all of the great work that we put in, it goes to waste. People don't use it for doing things or people don't take action with it, which means that all of the time we spent on the analysis hasn't actually had any impact on the business or on the organization. There are two types of data that you need to build a good story. The first one is the data that you already have. That's quantitative data. It's the data you find in dashboards, it's the data that you find in models, it's trends, it's anomalies, it's all of that great information that you're pulling together and analyzing with math and statistics. The second piece of data is qualitative data. Qualitative data is data that is conversations, it's documents, calendars, it's understanding what's going on in the business around all of the data that you're looking at. You can think of this as the conversations you hear on the radio on the way into work, or maybe you've heard some advertising about an event that's going on in a particular place, and when you're looking at the data for your business, you can see how that event impacted sales. That's qualitative data. That sort of data is critical to getting the details and providing the color for a good story, but it's often forgotten when we think about the quantitative data that comes in dashboards. We're going to take a five-step approach to building our story. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the quantitative data. This is the data in dashboards, it's the data that we're analyzing, and we're trying to understand what the trends are. Once we have a good understanding of those trends, we're going to begin to look for qualitative data on what might have been driving them, what was happening as the data was generated or over the time period that we're looking at that might have caused the trends and the changes that we saw when we looked at the quantitative data. Once we've got those, we're going to have a big pile of raw material. We'll talk more about raw material later on. Then we're going to begin thinking about our audience and how we can contextualize this story in a way that makes it meaningful for our audience. Once we've done that, we can begin building the story itself. That means putting together the information in the way that we want to present it, putting it in the right order, thinking about the visuals that we're going to use and the bullet points that we're going to write down. And then the fifth step is we're going to go back and we are going to brutally edit what we wrote down the first time to make sure that we are clear, concise, we're as brief as we can be, and that we're only including a very focused amount of information that our audience is going to understand. Because the more focused we can be, the clearer the takeaways are going to be, and the more likely the audience is to do something with them. Now, this five-step process is going to be circular. You will get to the end and think, man, I wish I just knew this one extra piece of information. It's not linear. You can go back to the beginning and you can reanalyze something else as you come up with questions throughout the process. But if you work through it step by step and you circle back to answer your own questions, you'll find that you have a ton of really good raw material and you come out with a really compelling story at the end of it that your stakeholders are going to love and that you're going to be able to use to make them drive action and to drive change within your organization. 
The first step we're going to take is we're going to mine the quantitative data. That means going to our dashboard, it means going to our raw data source, and it means pulling together all of the information that we have. We want to be as analytical as possible about this, and we want to take our time with it. Sometimes this can be the most time-consuming step, it's just understanding what's happening within the data. We want to be looking for trends, we want to be looking for anomalies, we want to be looking for things that stand out. If we're looking at things like year-over-year -year changes, we want to be able to quantify those changes and the things that influence them. So we can look at not only the year-over-year -year change in percentage terms, but we can look at the year-over-year -year change in sales or in revenue terms, and we can begin to layer individual pieces in to really build an understanding of what happened and what drove the business. I'll give you an example. If we see a big change in year-over-year -year revenue, we want to understand which stores or which products drove that particular change. And if we can see that, hey, this product is up and this product is down, we can begin to bridge those together until they add up to the year-over-year -year change that we're looking for. That helps us tell the story of what happened as the data was generated. And with, with that understanding of the product, then we can begin to research qualitative pieces. You wanna build your quantitative analysis by thinking of getting as much raw material together as possible. If you think about sculpting a story, when a sculptor starts, they have a big block of material that they're gonna use and they're gradually gonna chip pieces off it until they get something that they want at the end, something that looks beautiful. We're gonna do the same thing with our data. We're gonna build up a big pile of raw material that we're then gonna sculpt a story out of at the end. What we're doing right now is we're building that raw material and the deeper we go with a quantitative analysis, the better the raw material we're gonna have when it comes to building the story. As you mine your quantitative data, you wanna make sure that you're starting with a hypothesis. This is something that you can prove or disprove with the data that you have. If you're looking at year-over-year -year sales, you can say, I think sales went up because we sold more of this product. Dive into the data. When you look at that product, did you sell more of it? If you did, that's great. You found one driver of the year-over-year -year change. If it wasn't that product, you can come back and think about what else might have driven the year-over-year -year change in sales numbers. The more you do this and the more you go through with a hypothesis-driven approach where you're trying to prove and disprove your theories about what's happening in the data, the more raw material you're going to generate. But all of these pieces are going to be similar questions to the one your audience is going to ask when you ultimately present them the data. So having all of this pre-calculated and pre-thought about gives you a really good stack of information that you can use to address questions as they come up during your presentation. The next step is to gather the qualitative data. This is all the details about why something might have happened. And there's a ton of different ways you can do this. Qualitative data is almost infinite. There's a ton of it floating around. But what you want to do and how you want to do it really, really depends on your business and how the data was generated. My background is in hospitality. When we talk about what's happening in the business of hospitality, we look at individual hotels, we look at travel trends, we look at airlines, and all of those individual pieces contribute something to the story. When we find information about a change in the quantitative data, I'll often research with the qualitative data to try and find out what's going on. So if there's a trend in a particular market or in a particular place, I'll do some Googling on that market and that time frame to find out if there was anything going on. If I have contacts or friends that live in a particular place, I'll reach out to them and see if they can provide any context about what might have been happening in that market. What the qualitative data does is it provides the details that helps you color in between the lines that are provided by the quantitative data. So you're filling in the details of the story and fleshing it out and helping make it real for your audience. And as you make it real for your audience, they're going to be able to remember it better. These qualitative details are critical so that your audience can really engage with your presentation and almost see what you're talking about. The gold standard of qualitative data comes from primary sources. That means talking to people that sit in particular markets or work in particular departments or particular stores. It means looking at news articles, calendars, understanding what events happened in particular places and what might have driven the trends. Understanding what holidays fell and how your typical customer responds to a particular holiday. Do they do something then that they don't do otherwise? Understanding all of those pieces and pulling it all together is what's really going to bring your story to life when you eventually present it to the audience. The next step is to think about the audience. And as we think about the audience, we're going to get really focused. So visualize who your audience is and imagine presenting to them. There's two levels that you want to think about your audience from. The first one is around what we're going to include in the presentation itself. The second part is how we're going to present the data that we have 
in order to make it most impactful for that particular audience. We'll talk about them a little bit separately. The first one, we want to understand how the audience is going to relate to our story. Pick something simple. We want to be answering one question with our presentation for the audience. If there are multiple questions or multiple areas of focus, we want to split up our presentation so that we address one at a time. Keep it focused. Keep it simple. Focus only on what the audience needs to know and take out everything that they don't need to know. Think about the points your audience is going to find most impactful. What are the takeaways you want your audience to have? What do you want them to learn from your presentation? Make sure you focus around those and you stay hyper-focused on just presenting those and taking away anything that might be extraneous or might confuse the sort of fundamental point that you're trying to make. The second piece we want to consider in relation to our audience is how we're going to present the information. Depending on how sophisticated the audience is, you will change the type of visuals that you use or the type of metrics that you put in your presentation. If you're presenting a data science project to a business audience, you want to use the business terms for things. You don't want to roll back on the data science terms for them unless you're confident your audience is going to understand complex error metrics and R squareds and F1 scores and things like that. Stick to language they understand. Stick to visualizations and bullet points that are simple. Your visualizations should be clear, they should be labeled, and they should be easy to understand. Don't use super complex visualizations. Really, if it takes you more than a sentence or two to explain what's happening, that visualization is too complex and you need to pick something different or you need to split it up and try and focus it down on exactly the point that you want it to make. You can also annotate visualizations, so highlight the critical points. Draw rings around them, draw trend lines, draw arrows to draw attention to the right area of the visualization to make your point as clear as possible. When it comes to bullet points, keep the bullet points short and make them as few as possible. There's an old saying in presenting that if your audience is reading the slide, they're not listening to what you're saying. So if you give them a ton of text to read, they're going to spend all their time reading the slide and none of their time listening to you. You want to anticipate any questions that your audience is going to have. You could do two things with this information. The first thing is you could just have anticipated the question and have the answer off to the side somewhere so that you know you can share it when you need to. The second thing you can do is you can head off the question by including the information in the presentation or otherwise addressing it as you talk through your talking points. Either one of these is really effective. There really is no better way of doing it. Having that information to hand is going to make it really clear that you've done your homework, you understand what you're talking about, and you've really given a lot of thought to the problem. That builds trust, and if your audience trusts you, they're going to be a lot keener on taking the actions that you recommend at the end of your presentation. Now that we've got an understanding of our audience, we're going to start building out the story that we want to tell. I present a lot in PowerPoint. I like to do this in PowerPoint, but you can do it in Word or any sort of text editor or any sort of slide maker. What I like to do is I like to set up slides that are the main story points, the main points that I want to make as I walk through it. I just put a title on the slide and then I organize all the slides in the order I want my story to be in. The reason I do this is because it helps me visualize how the presentation is going to flow from slide to slide. You really want things to be logical. You want no big leaps between slides. You want it to seem like, okay, this, then that, then that, in an easy way, sort of walking your audience towards the conclusion. If you're presenting in a business context, you want to make sure you have the most important information up front. You also want to have a quick summary in the end to make sure that you're clear about what the takeaways are and that your audience has something they can walk away with and know exactly what they need to do and exactly what they need to use. The final step is going to be the most painful, and this is editing. Editing kind of sucks because you've done a lot of great work to get to this point, and what you're going to do now is you're going to take an awful lot of it and put it aside. The more focused you can be with your presentation, the better the audience is going to like it. They're going to appreciate the fact that you are respectful of their time, you stay focused on the right point, and you gave them something that was a really clear takeaway. You want to edit to make it clear, and you want to edit to make it concise. Clarity is staying focused on one point and making sure that things flow logically from place to place. Making it concise means that we're not going off on tangents unless they're absolutely necessary. We're getting from point A to point B, the beginning to the end of the presentation, in a straight line as efficiently as we can. I want to reinforce again that sometimes this process is circular. You're going to be editing through the story and you're going to think, man, I wish I had pulled up this. There is nothing wrong with going back to the beginning, reanalyzing something, asking somebody else to get some more qualitative data, or beginning to rethink how you imagined your audience to be in order to change the presentation or to move things around within the story. 
if you go through this cycle a few times, you'll find that the end product is significantly better than if you just go through it once. That was a lot of talking, but let's go through some takeaways. The first one is that stories are how humans remember information. They're how we've communicated for centuries. We didn't communicate in statistics, we communicated in stories. So putting together a good story with lots of detail is gonna make your presentations more memorable than if you pack them with facts and figures. The second thing is that there's two types of data you need to build a good story. There's quantitative data, which is all the hard numbers that you get from dashboards and spreadsheets, and qualitative data, which is the information that you're gonna get from talking to people, from reaching out to people who were involved, and from really understanding the business context around the data. The third part is to really understand what's most critical to your audience. Stay laser focused on what is critical to them and what you want them to take away from your presentation. The fourth takeaway is to make sure that you're editing for clarity and for conciseness and to know that you might have to go through this loop of analysis to storytelling, to understanding the audience, to editing, back to analysis, back to understanding the audience, back to storytelling a few times before you really nail down what the story is and exactly what you want to present. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please like and subscribe to the channel. We look forward to seeing you next time.